Welcome to Taste Buds. I'm Deborah Eckerling, goal strategist, writer, and foodie. And today I'm speaking with Jamie Schler, who is a writer based in France, specializing in food and culture. She's also an author, hotel owner, jam maker, and so many other things. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you, Deborah. I'm just I'm really thrilled to be here. This is this is really fun. Oh, well, I love uh, how many uh, how much of a hyphenate or multi hyphenate you are. But I feel like let's start with you're in France. How I'm did France. that happen? I one day I was living in New York after college, working a job I didn't like, and nothing was going my way. And I said, I just, I, I just had this urge I had to leave, and I had like money for a plane ticket to Paris, and that was about all I had, and two suitcases, everything else got either given away or dumped on, literally dumped on the street in trash bags. And I just picked up and I left. It was just something I had to do. And the next couple of years were very hard because I would go back home in Florida to, to my parents to temp for a couple of months until I could afford to go back for another month or two to Paris. And I was back and forth for two years. And then I met a Frenchman and got married and settled down, had a family. That's the story. Why France, though? I think it's one of those things that it's just everybody went to France. It was in the late 80s, early 90s, and it was just the place Americans went. And I happened to have a friend who said, well, I'll go with you. So I'm like, okay. I didn't know. I, it was nothing was planned. I just, it's just like I had to leave. That was just the urge. And I just went. I feel like food is in everything you do. Food has always been, since I was a kid, uh, the, the main focus of my life. Um, I love the story that my mother told me when I was adult that when I was a baby, she kept taking me to the, to the doctor saying something is wrong with this child. All she wants to do is eat all the time. And it's basically it's always been about food. I mean, I worked in the arts when I lived in Philadelphia and New York, and I worked for a, a couple who owned an art gallery. I managed the gallery space and they lived behind it and they just had lots of cookbooks. So whenever they were out of the gallery, I would just take their cookbooks and read them and copy recipes. And, and that was, I was poor, too poor to go back to my apartment and make them, but I just read recipes. So food was always something, um, that fascinated me really. And um, just all the sensations about food. And eventually, once I had kids, I started to be fascinated by the cultural aspects of food and what they mean. Um, because as I kind of started to tell you before we started ta to tape, um, you know, we raised two sons that are American, French, Jewish, Catholic, um, with a little bit of North African where my husband lived before we married and, you know, the Eastern European of my family. And to and then we raised our son, spent many years in Italy when they were very tiny, immersed in the culture. So they had all of these cultures that made up who they were. And food was just the easiest and most it just made sense to use food to kind of separate all their different heritages and cultures and use it as a vehicle to teach them about all of the different parts of who they are. So food was always tied to stories because stories would come with whatever food we made to put on the table to feed the boys to teach them about whatever they were. So that's my fascination with food. And that's my fascination with his, the history of food too and culture, the culture that you know, that's a big, huge part of food. There are certain foods that are called different things in different cultures. Mm -hmm. Is there one that you think really spans all of the different cultures that you're immersed in? Actually, you know, those are the kind of questions that are very, very hard for me to answer because I just like my mind starts going crazy. But actually, so what popped into my mind is, yes, um, there's a really traditional French dish called pot au feu, which is basically boiled beef and vegetables. And it's cooked, it's really simple. It's, you know, root vegetables, it's poor man's vegetables, and beef, and it makes a broth, and you eat it like that with 
usually with um, pickles and mustard. And it's very similar to the Jewish, a Jewish dish I grew up with. And I, I know when I wrote about it, I wrote about it for a magazine and people would say, well, that's just like, you know, in the Irish culture and in the, this culture and that culture. And I think that's probably the food that some variation of it is found in every culture that it, and it's, and it's really symbolizes home because it's a dish that you only make for your family. It's sustenance, it's warmth. Um, and that must be it. It just, yeah. And when you were talking about your sons and raising them with the different cultures and food, I, I just had this visual of, you know, here's a bowl of this. This is the French version. This is the Jewish version. <laughs> this is the American version. Do you just keep them separate? We always keep them separate. I, well, we always did keep them separate. It just made sense. It's like we're going to have a French meal or we're going to have, you know, it's a Jewish holiday. So we're going to make a Jewish meal or Shabbat. Um, or we're going to, you know, here's the dish that Nona Anna made, you know, their, their adopted grandmother made for them in Italy. And so we would have the stuff, everything that went with it. And um, I think it was just, it was always just fun as well, just to kind of concentrate on one thing at a time, one culture at a time. So how is what you do in immersed in food and culture, how do you spread this love, this obvious joy? to the world i focused on um as time passed i basically ended up focusing on french cuisine and i think i did that because as an american moving to to a country like to a country and then marrying into that culture i married a frenchman and i married into his family and i realized very early on. And at the same time, I was marrying into this very working class, very traditional, that you know, very family, uh, this family that made very traditional French foods, working class kind of foods. Um, I was also working in um, high end culinary tourism. And part of that job meant um, like taking clients into Michelin starred restaurants, but also I was an interpreter at a French cooking school, which is the, which is very high-end cooking. It's what used to be royal, you know, what the aristocrats and the nobles and the kings and queens ate. And I realized, I realized very early on that, that what I had learned as an American living in the States about French cuisine wasn't really what it was. Um, it was a lot more interesting and, and, um, and accessible. And so when I eventually became a writer, I was reading a lot about French food and I realized that even, you know, 20 years or so after I had moved to France, that those kind of myths about French food were still being perpetuated in American cookbooks and food magazines and food columns. It's like to understand and respect the culture, you need to understand and respect the food. And I think that something like French cuisine and Italian cuisine is just Americans face it, it's just so casual. Um, that they don't think that there's actually meaning behind the food. And so it kind of frustrated me that I was understanding what the food culture really was. And I kind of felt like I needed to share this to people like I was before I learned about it. And so I started to write about French food. And that meant um, you know, going back and, and explaining the history behind not only French food in general, French cuisine, but individual dishes. So something that an American thought was fancy, sophisticated cooking was actually something, you know, the peasants made, stuck on the stove, went back to the fields to work or to their shops, and then came back and took it off the stove. And it was cheap cuts of meat and cheap vegetables. And I just found it so fascinating to, to kind of deep dive into French food and use that to say, well, this is what this dish is and why it is what it is. It's not what you thought it was. Um, it's simpler. It's more accessible. It has these traditions behind it that you, you don't need to know the traditions behind the food or the stories behind the food, but it certainly makes the food a lot more fun to eat um, and to make if you understand um, 
why people a thousand years ago were making the same dish. I love how you use the word fun because I believe, you know, anything that you do that you infuse fun into, it's going to be better. It's going to taste better. It's going to come out better, whatever it is that you're doing. What recommendations do you have for people to look at French food as fun? Because you're right. People think of it as it's, this is serious food. Right. Um, I think the first thing that people have to understand is that they shouldn't be afraid of French food and they should kind of, um, I mean, this is why I share the recipes because um, take something really simple, French onion soup. Americans have this, you know, vision of what it is. And when I looked, when I started to write a, a, a blog post about it, I looked at the articles that had been published in, you know, food magazines and food columns and newspapers in the States. And the recipes were filled with, you know, a lot of fancy ingredients and a lot of uh, expensive ingredients. And it was complicated to make. Whereas, and I'm like, well, wait a minute, but my husband used to make, makes this at home and he doesn't use any of this. He uses onions, salt and pepper and water and that's it. And when you ask any French person, they're like, yeah, it's onions, water, salt and pepper. And when you go back through time and you look through cookbooks from a century, two centuries, three centuries or longer before, it's exactly the same recipe. And, um, and so when you, you know, when you tell the, when you share this thing and then you say, well, you know, there's also these silly stories about it too. I mean, anybody who reads through, you know, the posts on my Substack realizes that a lot of French foods have these really kind of silly stories. Sometimes they're legends, sometimes they're folklore, sometimes they're weird traditions like a French onion soup, which used to be, it was called the drunk, drunk men's soup because um, people after they had like, you know, gotten drunk all evening, they would stumble into a, you know, into a Parisian bistro at three in the morning and, um, and have French onion soup to kind of clear their head and take away the, 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 the vapors of wine so that when they would go home, it, they wouldn't smell like alcohol. That was a serious. And so it became tradition then to carry a chamber pot of French onion soup to newlyweds on their wedding night um, to kind of not only revive them after partying with their family all day, it's like when they slip away to, you know, c- consummate the marriage. So their friends would come and bring them. And it would not only, it was not, not only to revive them so they could consummate the marriage and not pass out from all the drinking they had done, but it was supposed to take away the, you know, the fumes of wine and the effects of the wine. So, you know, there's just like all of these kind of weird, silly stories that, that, I don't know. To me, it just it just makes the next time you make French onion soup, you you think about these stories and you're like, oh yeah. <laughs> I'm all in, and it is summer and it is warm, and I'm like, we're talking, and I'm like, hmm, I need to make more <laughs> French onion soup because <laughs> having the history behind it really helps you invest in yeah. making the dish. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the first tip is don't take French food so seriously. Anything else? Right. Right. Don't take it seriously. Most of the dishes that people assume are kind of high end kind of dishes are actually family. Anything that's cooked in a pot is a family dish, which means that it's usually economical and simple. And that's, that's like the basic of most of the you know, most of what, most of the French dishes that Americans are familiar with, I should say. Yeah. And what if someone wanted to make something fancy in French? A lot of the stuff that I discover is, is what we call is, is more desserts, pastries. Um, Because the French don't really do that much pastry making at home. They do very simple stuff, Um, pound cakes, things like that. So the majority of the desserts that you find, the pastries are high end because they're what we call pastry shop pastries. They're, they're, they were made for either, you know, royal households or famous people's house, wealthy people's households or for pastry shops. So those are more of the things that are, that cost more money to make, that are, take a lot of time to do. So 
as far as French food goes, everything that I've, you know, my husband, my French husband, and I put our heads together. It's like, what should I do next? And we just keep coming up with dish after dish after dish, savory stuff. And it's all, it's all home cooking. And I'm trying to figure out, now I've got to go back and research and figure out what, what is still, what are people still making that's really what I refer to as kind of royal aristocratic cooking dishes. And when you started talking about the fancy stuff, my mind went to desserts. Do you have a favorite French dessert? Um, I might have a lot of French desserts. Um, I mean, I just wrote about eclairs, but I actually like, um, I like making shoe puffs and filling them with pastry cream and icing them. I, I love, yes, I, a couple of desserts that are, that are very, very local specialties that are not widely known are uh, the Gâteau Nantes. I lived in Nantes for, for 12 years, um, which is in the west of France. And they have the specialty that's mostly a very dense kind of one layer cake that's made of a lot of almonds. It's almond rich. And then you soak it in rum, <laughs> <laughs> in a rum syrup, rum sugar syrup, and then you ice it, and just a plain white powdered sugar and water icing. But I change out the water for more rum, so it's really heady. Um, and the other is a local specialty from Nantes in Angers, which is the next city over, which is a creme, which is a, it's, you beat cream, you beat a kind of fresh cheese, that's kind of like sour cream, but not as tangy. Um, and then you beat egg whites and you fold them all in together and you let it strain overnight. So it kind of gets very mousse like and there's sugar in it. And then you serve it with berries in the summer. And that's just the kind of thing that's, that I love. And I, I think it's really interesting that it's both of those things really interest me because not only are they really great, but they've always stayed local. There, there are these local things that just don't, didn't travel outside this, you know, the region limits or the city limits. So it's interesting. So those are some of my favorite stuff. What final food for thought do you have for people like me mm -hmm. who want to start playing with French food? The thing is, ju is just to stay calm. <laughs> That's always my thing. And not be afraid of it. Um, you know, people are constantly asking me questions. Uh, can I change out this for that? Can I do this? Can I do that? And I'm the kind of person that says, just try it. If it doesn't come out, it's probably still going to taste good. Even if it's not presentable, you can still eat it. But the thing is about French fruit is just, like I said, stay calm. It's simpler than you think. And it's, it's a lot homier than you think. And when you start to look at a recipe and look at the ingredients not the not the version that you know the 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 magazine version that has all kinds of liquors liqueurs in it and and wines and you know all these porcini mushrooms and all this stuff that's really not accessible to everyone it's it's really ba french food is really basic i have to say i'm really good at baking a pastry but i'm not a great cook i'm a nervous cook um probably because i like the science behind pastry so when you have a, a savory dish cooking I get nervous because it's more like playing it by ear um, but when you actually analyze what it is and why it is that way it becomes very very simple and I think that's what people need to to do is there something you know now that you wish you knew when you started this great adventure what I love about where I am now, which I wish I had, I had known about, you know, 20 years ago, maybe is um, just the, the, the information you can find in old texts and old cookbooks. And now I read them. Um, a lot of places have them online. So you can go and get, you know, 14th century, 16th century, 18th century cookbooks and texts and um, you know, treaties on, on, coffee and on medicine and whatever. Um, and I wish I'd started doing that earlier, reading 
a lot of this stuff that gave me a lot of background because even two years into my sub stack, I go back and I read the early stuff before I had discovered a lot of these texts and thought, oh, I know so much more about it now. But, um, but I always worry that I'm giving too much detail to my readers because it just, the details are what fascinate, fascinate me. So. Well, you clearly <laughs> love all of the different elements of it. And mm -hmm. now if I have like, any sort of cooking question, like beyond this century, I know who to call, right? You can call because... me, you can find me on social media. I answer questions. People come to me with all kinds of questions and my sub stack, I love answering people because I love helping people become more comfortable with, with discovering foods and cooking. And, um, you know, once in a while you get people say, well, I don't cook or I can't, or I'm afraid you're just so good at it. And I'm like, no, I, you know, I learned and you just really need patience and, and that confidence to do it. So, I mean, the confidence to actually say, well, I'm going to sit down and concentrate and read, you know, what it says, what the recipe says, and then understand it. And um, yeah, so I love answering people's questions. <laughs> And where can people learn more about you and find your Substack? Well, you can find my Substack on Substack.com and it's called Life's a Feast by Jamie Schler. And on all my social media, Twitter, Instagram, probably every, everywhere, I'm at Life's a Feast. Because Life's, life's a Feast. A feast. I, I feel like we should have started with this. Life's a Feast. So why not enjoy it, right? Isn't that the point? Yes. That's it's it's enjoying, it's sharing, it's discovering. Um, and I learned a very, very great lesson from my cousin Chuck, which I should I should heed more often, but people should heed. And that's um, even when you're alone, your meal should be special. And I think is absolutely right. Even if even if you know you're just getting, you know, a takeout pizza, set a place, pour a glass of wine you know, the good silverware that you took from your grandmother, you know, that kind of thing. It's, um, yeah. And I think having this sub stack because the hotel gives me, gives us no time. We used to cook all the time. My husband and I all the time, two meals a day. Um, and with the hotel, we don't have time. So when we finally do, and we sit down and we set the table, it's like, oh, this, we should do this more often because it's just so, it's so special to be able to, even if you're eating something simple, just to say, we made this, we're putting it on the table, we're sharing it, and we're enjoying it. That's, yeah. You know. And I feel like I should have asked this at the onset, but I'm going to ask it now. Where did the the name Life's a Feast come from? Because obviously it's so meaningful. I, when I started my blog, my blog blog, my first blog in 2008, I actually started it because um, I'd been working, <laughs> that's very quick, I'd been working as a milliner for many, many years. Um, and I stopped it for various reasons. And so I just started cooking and baking. And after about a year of this, my husband and older son sat me down and said, we're sick of you talking about food all the time. So you're starting a blog um, because you need to channel it. And, you know, you know, share that obsession you have with food with other people who also have that obsession. And so we came up with a whole bunch of different names, but they were all taken. And my son and I just kind of narrowed it down until we found one. And it just stuck. And so I, it became my identity, really, on social media and everywhere else. Life's a feast. And, um, and you know, it is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jamie Schler, for spending time with me and giving us this wonderful window into your life and French food. And thank you for tuning in to Taste Buds with Deb. Don't miss an episode. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, your favorite podcast platform, and you can go to jewishjournal.com slash podcast to read the articles. And we're going to have a recipe from Jamie in there as well. And you can learn more at tastebudswithdeb.com. Go ahead fun with whatever you're doing because life's a feast until next time bon appetit